Hi guys, it's thanks for stopping back to Pete's Garage. Well, it's time to install our intake manifold. And in this video, I'm going to talk about just a couple things for installing intake manifolds. Of course, preparing, getting it ready. And, and then uh, I want to talk about thread conditioning. I've been kind of saving that for this video, talking about threads and thread conditioning, specifically because it's aluminum heads and I'm going to be using stainless steel bolts. And I want to talk about something called galvanic corrosion, something you should be aware of. Uh, that's the potential between dissimilar metals when you use fasteners and what it, problems it can cause. Uh, and if you recall, if you've been following the videos, you, this is the Edelbrock dual plane, dual quad manifold that's been modified for fuel injection. I machined the runners, welded in the bungs for the injectors, and I made this top plate. The top plate is an adapter to go from the footprint for a carburetor, which is kind of small, to a wider footprint for the throttle bodies. The, uh, I cleaned up the whole thing, I, I powder coated, sand blasted, bee blasted it first, cleaned it up, then I powder coated with Eastwood's OEM wheel silver, it's a metallic, and then I coated the entire thing with the high gloss clear, and it came out fantastic. You'll see when I get done, it really does look beautiful. Um, it really doesn't do it justice, I don't, I don't know if you can see it in the high def video, but it came out gorgeous, I'm really happy with that. So, let's get started, we'll talk about threads in aluminum, preparing them for, for fastening, and then we'll put our manifold in and I'll talk a little bit about galvanic corrosion. Okay, now, what I'm going to do here is, I saved this for this part of the video, and I didn't do this before I put this heads on for a reason, because if you are just changing your intake manifold or cleaning the top end of your engine, you leave your heads bolted on, you still should do this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to chase out the threads, all the threads on the head. Even though I, I had it together once, but even if they're brand new, you still need to chase out the threads to make sure they're clean. Clean threads are very, very important when you're working with aluminum, actually any material. You should clean all the threads on your engine when you're putting it together to make sure they're chased out. There's no FM inside the threads. The threads are nice and clean. They're ready to roll and when you put the bolt in it's going to be nice and smooth and you're going to even clamp load when you put the torque on it. I'm going to be cleaning out these threads. I'm using something, I'm going to use a bottoming tap and a bottoming tap is flat on the bottom. It's not like a starter tap. A starter tap has a, a point on it and it doesn't have threads all the way down. It's intended to start threads in a hole. This is a bottoming tap. You want to use a bottoming tap when you chase out the threads because uh, it'll, it'll have an even contact with threads all the way through. Now, uh, if you do happen to have a, a, a torn or pulled out threads in your head, uh, regardless if it's cast iron or aluminum, you don't have to fret. You can put in something called a helicoil. And a helicoil, let me put down my tap wrench here. A helicoil is just a, a thread that you would take your hole, you would drill it out, you would tap the hole for the outside threads of your helicoil, you would screw the helicoil into the hole, lock it in place, and then the inside threads would be your new threads for the bolt that you stripped out. So you can use a helicoil. I'm not going to do that in this video because I don't need to use them. These are new heads. So what I have done here is I want to protect the rest of the engine from FM. You don't want to get any shavings in fall in anything. So I've taped off, taped off my intake runners. I paint this little shelf here out of really thick, really, really wide um, masking tape. So if anything comes out of the hole, it falls in here. And this hole happens to go all the way through. So I got tape on the bottom of the hole to make sure nothing falls through and lands in the valley where the lifters are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my starting tap and I'm going to put it in my hole just like this. And I'm just going to start to Started in the threads. I don't want to force it because it will cut new threads and you can damage the threads that are in place. So I'm going to gently turn it just to make sure the threads are chased out. If you can run a little bit of encounter, I got this nice little ratcheting uh, tap wrench. It works great for this kind of application. So I'm just going to go in gently and if you meet with any resistance, stop immediately, back the tap out and look to make sure there's nothing in the hole. So I'm just going to run this through until I feel it touch the bottom like this. straight through the head, straight through the hole. Okay, I can feel it touching the bottom masking tape. And I'm gonna turn it in reverse, and I'm gonna back it out. And I'm gonna be very careful that when I take this out, none of these shavings or anything has a possibility of falling inside. I would, use, I would normally use a vacuum when I'm doing this, but you wouldn't be able to hear me talk, and it would be really, really loud. So I'm just doing this without the vacuum cleaner. Don't use air, don't use compressed air to blow it out because you'll blow it all over the place. It falls in the lifters, it'll fall in your cam, it'll fall in your lifters, and it's all you need is one little piece of material to clog your lifters or your 
push rods or score your cam, anything in your engine is going to ruin it. So I'm going to back this out very gently. Now I'm going to pull this away very gently. And there, my hole is chased out. So I'm looking in the bottom of the hole and I can see a little bit of metal filings or aluminum filings on the tape on the bottom. So I'm going to vacuum this out, clean this up, and I'm going to finish all the, the holes on both the cylinder heads. And then when I put the manifold in, we'll talk about galvanic corrosion. So let me clean out the rest of the head, all the rest of the holes, and then we'll get to that. Just to show you really quick, this is the masking tape I took off the bottom of the hole. And you can see, it might be difficult, I hope it focuses, focuses right. I think it's going to focus. You can see the bottom of the hole had a lot of filings on it. So even though it was a fairly new head and I ran a bolt in there once, the, there were filings that came through the th uh, threads and came out the bottom. So cleaning out your threads is important. That cleaned out the threads really nice. Now I can finish the rest of them. Now I have all the holes done. All the holes are chased out on both of the heads. Everything is nice and clean. I vacuumed everything up. After I was finished, I made sure the holes were clean. I vacuumed those out. And then I cleaned the head. I cleaned the surface of the head with lacquer thinner. Just wiped it down to make sure the surface was per perfectly clean. And I just sat my gasket in place. And I'm just doing this preliminarily. So you want to put it on here make sure your gaskets line up. And here, you can see where I did the port matching, how the gasket lines up with the port. That way you're sure that let me, let me exaggerate this. You're not going to have this kind of condition where the, the head will stick out inside the gasket because you'll be losing flow there. And I don't have it where the gasket is too big. So the port matching, I'll engage that again. The port matching is to make sure that the, the opening of the head, the port, matches the port of the gasket and to the intake head. So they're both matched up perfectly. What I do want to show you is, I'm going to move this over here. And you can see on my intake, or on this particular... Uh, coolant passageway, you see how the, the, the there would normally be a hole here on a different head? This gasket is made for a couple engines. So I got this tab that's sort of sticking off into this coolant passageway and what I do is after I put the gasket on with sealer, I'll just trim that off to make sure there's no uh, obstruction to coolant flow and also this could get, coolant could get underneath there and work its way into underneath the gasket so I'll just trim off that when I'm done. Um, then I'll talk about, uh, we'll go into this end gasket when I put the manifold on. Uh, but before I bolt this on and before I put it in place, let's talk about galvanic corrosion because I'm using stainless steel bolts to put this manifold on and the head is made out of aluminum. And when you have uh, coolant flowing close to a hole where you have aluminum touching stainless steel, there's a chance for galvanic corrosion. You could use steel bolts that will reduce the odds of a galvanic corrosion. And let me show you why it's different and what those materials are and what the chemical compounds could happen or what the chemical compounds do that cause it or accelerate galvanic corrosion in aluminum. Before I put my gasket on, I put a very light coat of Permatex. This is a gasket maker. This is called the right stuff, made by Permatex. You can get this at uh, any store, and it comes with a nice um, tube on it, so when you squeeze it out with your caulk tube, you can get a nice even bead. But I put this on by hand. So I just put a little bit on my finger and uh, rubbed it around. And I put a little bit amount around the intake ports here, and I didn't put a ton of it on there. I don't want it, uh, to, to mush it out because it will affect when you torque down your, your manifold. You don't want it too mushy. I just put, I was a little liberal, a little bit more around the uh, coolant passageway, but I didn't put a, a ton on there. I also put a little bit on the back of the gasket because I want to have 100% contact or 100% uh, sealant around inside the paper. I don't want to leave any of the grains open on the paper, so I put a little bit on the back, very little bit. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my gasket, I'm going to set it in place, like that, and I'm going to push around the openings to make sure I get a sealing all the way around 100%. And if you get a little bit on your finger, don't worry, just wipe it off. I'll push it down all the way around the gasket, all the way around the openings to make sure it's sealed 100%. Last thing you want to do is have to pull off your manifold because you have a real small vacuum leak or a real small coolant leak. That is a real pain. If you get some on there, don't worry. I have my lint-free cloth here, and I have a little lacquer thinner on there. A little, little bit of lacquer thinner will clean it off. You don't want to have anything on the surface here before you put the manifold on. So you know, cleanliness is a really important when you put gaskets on. They're nice and clean. Lint-free lint -free cloth. A little lacquer thinner cleans that right up as I'm pushing it down to make sure that I get a 100% seal around all those ports between the gasket 
and the head, just like that. Clean that up a little bit. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to take my cloth, turn it inside out. I'm just going to go around my intake ports to make sure there's no excess sealant inside the gasket, or inside the port, making sure it stays pressed down. I don't want to have any of that stuff flying off going inside the engine. So I'll do this on this side, and repeat the process on the other side, just like that. Can be messy. Just be as neat as possible. Clean it up nice and clean on the intakes. Intakes will be nice. The runners are clean. Everything is nice and nice and clean. No extra gasket sealant anywhere. Nice and clean on the surface. And it's pushed down all the way. I had a little bit on my finger there. I'll just wipe that off. Nice clean surface. And if you have any up on your head, if you want to clean it up, up on top, this is a good time to do it so it doesn't squish out all over the place. Just like that. Nice and clean. Now I'll go to the other side. So what is galvanic corrosion and what do you need to make it happen or what makes it happen? You need three things to make galvanic corrosion happen. First, you need two electrically dissimilar metals like aluminum and stainless steel. One's going to act as a cathode, the other one's going to act as an anode. The second th thing you need, they must be in electrical contact with each other, means they have to be touching. And the third thing is required is the presence of an electrolyte. That electrolyte can be any anything from uh, battery acid, salt water, salt in the air with moisture, or uh, even antifreeze. The elements in antifreeze that keep it from freezing can act as an electrolyte and cause galvanic corrosion to begin. Now, in order to understand what I mean by electri electrically dissimilar metals, let me show you a couple charts I have. Okay, I made up this chart really quick to show you what electrically dissimilar metals are and where they fall on a chart. The, we have the active or the anode type metals on the bottom. These will be positively charged and the noble or the more cathode negatively charged metals on the top, which are actually positively, they have a positive potential, even though they're negative, they have a positive potential. That's the way this works. On the bottom we have magnesium is a minus 1.4 and in relation to the center here, this is hydrogen. So this is the electrical potential or volts in relation to zero to hydrogen. Magnesium minus 1.4, zinc minus 0.8, aluminum 0.6. So aluminum right over here at 0.6. I'll put, a, put this in parentheses because we're using, I'm using aluminum. Cadmium minus point, point 0.5, steel and iron minus point 0.4, cast iron minus point 0.3, lead minus point 0.1, uh, nickel, brass, copper, those are all around the zero range. Uh, bronze, we start to get in the positive range, point 0.1. Stainless steel, 314, 316 in the point 0.2 range, that's what I'm using there. Silver, silver's up there around a quarter, point 0.25. We get up to titanium, 0.3, and our most noble metal, which is a more of a cathode, is platinum, is way up here at 0.5. So, I'm using, in, in this example, and I'm talking about galvanic corrosion of aluminum head, right here, aluminum, and stainless steel, 314. So they're electrically dissimilar. Aluminum head is a negative 0 0.6, 0 0.6 negative, and our stainless steel bolt is a positive 0.2. So they're electrically dissimilar. They're not close like brass, copper, and nickel right in the middle here. They're not close. They're dissimilar. So they're on different sides of the chart. The, the uh, stainless steel fastener, stainless steel bolt is more, nathode, uh, more noble and act as a cathode. And my aluminum head is a negative. It's, gonna, it's an active metal. It's pos plus, which is going to act as the anode. And what, how is, why is that confusing? Why is it a minus over here and a plus over here? Well, when something is negatively charged, it has a positive potential. When something's positively charged, it has a negative potential. That's why they're opposite. That's what they mean electrically. So, we have the two metals. They're electrically dissimilar. They have to be placed close enough so they're touching electrically. And then we have to have an electrolyte to make the galvanic corrosion start to occur. And what will happen is one will migrate to the other. You'll see a, a coating. The ions will start to move from one material to the other and you'll see a white coating. And a good example of this is your battery. Your battery has copper. Copper is zero. And you have your lead uh, post on your battery, which is a minus 0.1. So they're electrically dissimilar. 
Now you have a copper wire next to a brass uh, post on your battery. You have an electrolyte, which is battery acid. Your battery acid comes in here, and it's usually self uh, hydrochloric, and you got an acid in place. The acid acts as, as the the uh, electrolyte, and that starts a galvanic corrosion. So if you live up north, and you start to have um, corrosion on your terminal of your battery, you notice there's a lot of corrosion on a terminal, on one terminal, it's because, number one, if you have salt uh, on the roads to dissolve the snow, if they use salt, you have salt water. The salt water splashes up uh, into the battery and into the engine compartment, acts as an electrolyte, causes the dissimilar metals start to get it, galvanic corrosion starts, and you see the buildup on one terminal of the battery. That's what galvanic corrosion is. You can live near an ocean. There's enough moisture in the air, and there's enough salt in the air to act as a uh, electrolyte and cause that to happen also. So in a dry desert, not so much. But when you have a moist atmosphere, you're near an ocean, salt in the water, whatever, it's going to start to act as electrolyte, galvanic corrosion will start to occur. So in order to make this, to show you how this works, why, why it works the way it does, let me, let me draw you another chart real quick. And this is what happens. Let's say this is my aluminum. This is my cylinder head right here. It's aluminum. It's my anode. We have my 314 or 316 stainless steel bolt that's going to go into the cylinder head. This is going to act as the cathode. And we have two things here. First, we have current flow. We have electron current flow. An electron current flow, uh, I can use this color, electron current flow happens here, this direction, when we're talking about electricity. Okay, this is for electron. 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 Electrical flow. Electrical current flow. This happens with electricity. And of course, they have to be, in order for current to flow, they have to be touching, which is a dead short. So now they're touching. Current flow. Now galvanic corrosion occurs when we have ionic current flow, or ionic conduction. Ionic conduction happens the opposite direction. The ionic conduction happens this way, and these are ions. Ionic conduction. So, the three things we need to happen for galvanic corrosion to occur. We have an anode and a cathode. We have two electrically dissimilar metals. We have aluminum. I mean, fill this in, cathode. We have aluminum, which was a minus 0.3. And we have our stainless steel, which is a, was a positive, like, a, what was it, point, point 0.2, I think, something like that. Point 0.2 or point 0.3. I think it was point 0.2. I believe it's point 0.2. Point, point 0.2 or point 0.1. So we have dissimilar metals, electrically dissimilar. Aluminum, stainless steel. They are connected electrically. They are bound together. When you put the bolt in the hole, they are now electrically, electrically connected. It is an electrical conduction, current flow from the cathode to the anode. We have that. Then what we do is we put in, we have, let me pretend that we have here some, we have an electrolyte. Whatever we're going to call it. Metal. Uh, it's going to be a salt water, acid, whatever. We put that in there. And this is what starts to happen. I'm going to erase this. And the anode, or the aluminum, becomes a sac the, the sacrificial piece, or the sacrificial part. And what happens, it'll start to wear away, like that. The ions from the aluminum will start to wear away. They will go through the electrolyte, and they will deposit themselves on the cathode right here. This is where the buildup occurs. Okay? That's what galvanic corrosion is. It's not electrical current flow, it's ionic current flow. It happens in the presence of an electrolyte where one, the anode breaks down, travels through the electrolyte and collects on the cathode. Now, if you put a, if you think you're gonna get ahead of the game and you wanna protect your, your bolts on your engine or your starter, and you figure, hey, I'm gonna put a stainless steel bolt in my starter or stainless steel bolt so that they're easier to get out. Well, you just cause yourself more of a problem than you think because the aluminum, and the stainless steel are electrically dissimilar. You just bolted them together, and if any water, salt water, or anything gets on the starter from underneath, it's going to break down the anode or the aluminum. It's going to go onto the stainless steel. It's going to corrode, and they can become actually fused together ionically and almost like welded together. And when you go to take out your stainless steel bolt, it's going to snap just like that because the galvanic corrosion caused the two metals to be fused together ionically, not electrically, ionically, almost like welding. They become welded together at, an, at the level of the ion. That's what galvanic corrosion is. And I'm talking about it here 
Because if you do put stainless steel fasteners, or even, uh, which is which even higher than stainless steel, is like chromoly bolts. You put a chrom chromoly bolt into the aluminum, you run the risk of, risk of a galvanic corrosion. Now, there's things you can put on the threads to reduce that, but if you do, you're going to change your torque settings. It's going to shift your torque window, and, it, and it's something you have to be very, very careful of. So you're better off leaving it dry, nice and clean. Put the fastener in and make sure the area, the, the, the surface or the bolts in the area stays dry so galvanic corrosion doesn't occur. That's what galvanic corrosion is. So I have both sides ready to roll. I got my gasket on both sides. It's pressed down. It's nice and clean. Before I put it on, before I put the intake manifold on, a word about these end gaskets. Uh, I think it's common with most engines. These end gaskets, these cork gaskets, I'm not a huge fan of these at all. As a matter of fact, I don't even use them because if you put them in here, sometimes you put them in, they're hard to get in place. Uh, then when you put the manifold on it, they squish out. They'll, they'll go one way or another. And, and these aren't the greatest things. So I use the right stuff. I put a, a bead on the bottom here. I, I rub it on. I'll, I'll do that before I put it on. I'll show you that. And there's another reason I can't use that gasket is because after I welded the manifold, it was twisted a little bit. And it was twisted. And I had to machine it straight. So since I machined the faces of the manifold, the manifold is going to sit lower. It's going to sit closer. So if I take this manifold and sit this in here real quick, just like this, gently sit it in there. If I sit that in there and get it straight, just like that, and if I take this cork gasket, I can't even get it in there. So the opening in there, once I torque it down, is going to be smaller than this cork gasket. And if I use this cork gasket, it would smush right out. And the last thing you want is to have an intake manifold vacuum leak, or a leak right there where you can't get it after the engine is already put together. So I don't even use those cork gaskets. Let me take this out of the way. So, I'm going to put a bead of the uh, right stuff on the front and on the back china wall. These are referred to as china walls. I'll put them on there, and I'm going to do the same thing as the front. Or, I'm sorry, as, the, as I did on the back part of the gasket. I'm going to put a little bit, a little bit on around the surface of each of the ports, and a little bit on the intake manifold. I'll put a little bit of a finger on here, and then I'll put a bead. I'll do the same thing on the bottom part of the manifold. I'll put a little bit underneath just to make sure you get 100% coverage. Then I'll be ready to set the manifold in place. Oh, other thing. I have this tape here. Tape in the front, tape in the back so that when I get the squish out, it doesn't make a huge, huge mess on the front or back of the engine. That's just masking it off to keep it nice and neat. I'll have a little bit of tape. I'll have a piece on the intake manifold too. So when I put the, put the manifold on here, I can just wipe off the the, the uh, RTV or the right stuff that comes out of here, I can put it in place and after I took it down, take off the tape, it'll be a nice clean line right across the front and the back. Now I'm ready to put the manifold in. And when you go to do this job like this, it's an all or nothing proposition. That means you don't want to start half of it and then leave, go out and have dinner and come back, or come back the next day and then put the manifold in. It's all or nothing. I got everything ready before I even started. I got my fasteners ready. I got my torque wrenches ready. I have my uh, cleaner ready. I got my uh, RTV. We've got my right stuff on, all on here. And remember, this is a really thin coat here. You're just trying to make a seal. You're not trying to glue this thing together, so you don't need a thick coat there. I've got a bead on the front and rear china wall to make my gasket for the seal for the back. I have the manifold prepared underneath, so the mating surface has a very thin coat on it as well. And I'm ready to sit it in place. So. I'm just going to pick it up and grab it so you can handle it and line up the holes as best you can. You want to try and drop it in place and you only want to do it once. So I'm going to sit it in place and you can see it's starting to push out a little bit in the front which is good. I'm looking down the holes and I want to get this aligned. I'll go around the other side, make sure I have good alignment for all the holes, make sure it's sitting flat. You can feel it, make sure it's sitting flat, because you don't want it cocked in there. Now, I'm dropping all my bolts. Now, since I'm using stainless steel fasteners, which are very hard and sharp, I'm going to hand start all of them because if you start them with the wrench, you run the risk of cross-threading. 
and then you just added about five hours to your project. So I'm going to hand start these all in. I'll hand start them and I'll run them all down and then we'll start our torque sequence. Okay, all down the final torque. Now what I can do is I can come in and clean up my, my RTV, which is a big mess right now. Clean it up, make sure it seals underneath. All the way around. Then I'll go back and do the same thing on the back. And now I can come in here and just slowly remove the tape. Like that. There's one. Get off of there. That one. The tape helps, really does help a lot. Just be careful. Take your time. No need to rush. It's not going to come off of there. It's not going to dry in two seconds. So you got time. Take your time. When you take it off, you can see how neat the tape keeps that from making a big mess. Now I'm just, the distributor is going to sit here. You won't even see any of this. But I like to make it perfect anyway. Just the way I am. Nice and clean. There we go. I can go touch up the back now. Now after I let the manifold set just for a few minutes, I went back around and I torqued back all the bolts again. I torqued them all again to make sure they were stayed torqued, or to make sure they stayed torqued. And they move a little bit. So go back a few minutes later, run around your torque pattern, and make sure that the uh, bolts stay torqued. Uh, you can see that the in front where I put the tape, the RTV is nice and clean. And if you don't glob it on or if you're neat about it, you can uh, do a very nice job and uh, uh, look very presentable if you're very careful with the RTV. Same thing on the back. Not a ton of it. You're not gluing it together. You're just providing a seal there. And uh, came out good. There you go, guys. That's the installation of your intake manifold. Remember, take your time. Make sure you have your threads cleaned out, chased out. Your fasteners are clean. You know your torque spec, you have your torque wrench ready, uh, clean everything off, put a little bit of sealant on there, torque down in sequence, and check it after a few minutes to make sure it stays torqued. You follow those procedures and I'm 99% sure you will successfully install your intake manifold with no leaks when you go to start it up. If you have any questions, let me know. I'd be glad to answer them for you. You can give me a call or text. I'm always happy to answer your questions and please feel free if you have a comment. If you can uh, offer some suggestions to help everybody out, remember we're here to help everybody. I'm always learning from people in their comments, so I appreciate your comments. So help everybody out. If you have a suggestion, let us know. It helps us all out, and we all, we're all here together to learn. I appreciate you stopping by, uh, and, and again, give me a call or text with any questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by Pete's Garage.